so we'll continue the topic on case control studies so remember the term case control so what is case and what is control so one of the primary goals in epidemiology is we want to know what exposure can cause what disease so this is the main idea we are trying to look at now what is a case and what is a control so if you have the disease any person any sample that has the disease is called as a case any sample that does not have the disease is called as the control again in disease it can have exposed they can be exposed they cannot be exposed again in having controls you can have exposure no exposure now in a case control study first we select the diseased so we identify the disease we are looking at and after we identify the disease then we go for the exposure factor so it might sound similar to retrospective study so in a way it is also a form of retrospective study but it's not a retrospective cohort study so the general example again it's a retrospective study but not a cohort so it's not a cohort study in a cohort study we are always going from the factor to the disease in a case control study we are always going from the disease to the factor so here we decide on the number of cases so peeps cases are people with the disease and controls are people without the disease so you have a plus c which represents the number of people with the disease and b plus d which represent the people number of people without the disease now we decide on the exposure factor then we measure the past exposure what are we, what were the exposed to so a represents the number of people that were exposed to the to the factor with the disease number of cases with the exposure c represents the number of people with the disease but were not exposed now here comes the problem in cohort studies we talk about incidence of the disease here we talk about the proportion exposed so proportion exposed in cases and controls in cases the proportion exposed is people who were exposed divided by people the total number of cases in controls it's the number of people who were exposed by the total number of controls so this is the main problem in case control studies now let's take an example of the same coronary heart disease and smoking so here we are considering there are about 200 people who have coronary heart disease and the rest of the people are the ones that are without the disease then next we are checking people who smoke cigarettes who did not smoke cigarettes here we have 112 people out of 200 who have smoked cigarettes in the cases you have 400 cases out of that 176 smoke cases now the number of cigarette percentage of smoking cigarettes you find that about 56 percent of the people who have in cases smoke cigarettes and only 44 percent of the population in controls without the disease haven't smoked cigarettes. that does not mean when you do not smoke you won't get the disease that means that there is a higher risk of getting the disease when you smoke the cigarettes right so that's the case here now it depends on how many controls you take most common sense is to take at least two controls for each case sometimes for larger samples we take at least four controls for each case so here in designing a cohort study we take the cases and we take controls and we check what were they exposed to and what were what were they exposed to in terms of to get that disease for example when you are smoking you would have multiple factors that can affect you for example let's say if a patient presents to you with lung cancer the common factor that you're looking for is are you smoking next you're going to check whether the person has any other factor that has affected his chance of getting the disease now this understanding of designing a cohort study depends on we started with the exposed people and we checked whether they developed the disease or not in a case control study we check the opposite case so for example here we are looking at lung cancer and people who do uranium mining so in this we found that we have 32 people who have lung cancer 64 people who do not have lung cancer so here you have two to one controls to case in the 32 people who have lung cancer 23 of them 
were exposed to uranium mining. About zero of them were exposed to, who had, who did not have lung cancer, were exposed to lung uh, uranium mining. Now, the percentage of people who are exposed to uranium mining, you will get about 70 to 72 percent, and it's zero percent of the people who were not exposed to uranium mining, the, who were not getting the disease. Now, we can say that uranium mining can be associated and can is a main factor or is a certainly a good factor to determine that it might be a case for causing the lung cancer. Now, if you take the same case study and if you put it to another disease, let's say lung cancer and tobacco smoking, again here there is a chance that the percentage exposed is nearly similar, but here notice that it's a little higher in people who have lung cancer, people who have the disease, than in people who do not have the disease. What would be an example of a case control study? So let's say we have a distribution of 1465 lung cancer patients and a control group according to average number of cigarettes smoked daily over 10 years preceding the onset of illness. So we have declassified this based on the age in lung cancer patients and people in the control group. Now we focus on the disease results based on this particular example. When do we need a case control study? So a case control study is only usually conducted before a cohort or an experimental study. So the, this is what we call a precursor. So this is a precursor to the case control study. So this precursor is going to be helping us in understanding how this disease can work. Now, it is a relatively cheap way of conducting the test. So it's a relatively cheap test and you can conduct it in a shorter time. So for a given exposure, given disease, a case control study can investigate multiple exposures. So we can check for multiple exposure factors. Why do we prefer this is because when the disease is really rare and when the investigators intentionally search for the cases, we need a case control study. A cohort study of rare disease would need start with a large number of exposed people. To get that large number of exposed people, we need a case control study. So to find where the start happens, we need a case control study. Now, what are the issues in selection of cases? The main issue is should be that the cases should be homogeneous, meaning that the criteria and the definition of cases must be well formulated and documented. And if we use the diagnostic test to identify the cases, we use high sensitivity cases tests. So that will yield a high number of false positives or a low sensitivity test, which and thus generally have high specificity, will result in a lower number of false positives. So a mild positive, mild form of the disease may also include higher false positives than a severe form of the disease. So it also depends on the type of disease we are looking at. So there are three factors. One is the type of cases, the number of th types of testing, and third, the number of the type of the disease, whether how severe is the disease. Next is the incident cases. So incident cases are the ones that are newly diagnosed because we know that these are harder because they're, they are really closer in time of exposures and, and unlike prevalent cases, they are not likely the survivors of the disease. So and there are chances that we might misclassify the disease, so including the numbers that we can call false positives. So when we do that, we might find that the findings might be false. What are the issues in selection of controls? So conceptually, controls should come from the population at the risk of disease, so from which the cases develop. But practically, controls are not done that way because we take controls that can that to be similar on the key factors but without the disease because it is difficult to define the population at risk. So different types of controls may be used and they have different limitations. So the most common controls that are used are people, so these are people with disease, so without disease. Again, we have two classifications about them. One, they might be without disease but might be exposed. They might be without disease but they might not be exposed. So there are two groups that can be classified as controls. So remember the case that there might be two groups that can be classified as controls. Now, 
what are the types of controls? There are hospital controls. Hospital controls are generally ones that are similar quality of information and they are generally convenient to select because they might have the same characteristics or diseases that led to the hospitalization. Dead controls, if cases are dead, information of the past exposure will be given by the surrogates or the children or spouse, whoever those are. So dead controls also share the same limitation. The next one is best friend or neighbor controls may share similar characteristics because they are generally taken to the same pathogens. They are generally exposed to the same kind of pathogens. Next is population controls. This is a random digit dialing is often used to select population controls. So this is an example of random dialing. Next cases, for example, let's consider the McMahon's case control study of pancreatic cancer. So the cases were patients with histological diagnosis of pancreatic cancer in 11 Boston and Rhode Island hospitals from a specific date of 1974 October to 1979 August. The controls were all other patients who were under the care of the same physician in the same hospital at the time of interview of the patient with pancreatic cancer. Now, this is the data that you have. We are looking at the chances of the relative risk which is of pancreatic cancer by gender and by coffee drinking habits. So who is more chance, who is at the more chance of getting the disease? So we found that this table is a data of coffee drinking and the based on gender. Next, the estimated risk by cigarette and coffee drinking. So we want to check whether cigarette drinking and cigarette smoking and coffee drinking can have an effect as well. Right. So the selection of controls in the McMahon disease, they included all other patients who were under the care of the same physician in the same hospital at the time of interview of a patient with pancreatic cancer. They also excluded patients with pancreatic or hepatobiliary tract diseases known to be associated with strong smoking or alcohol consumption. And they also excluded patients with cardiovascular disease, risk, any other diseases. They also excluded non-whites older than 79 years of age. Next. We found that they found that there is a high difference in exposure based on the percent of coffee drinking habits. So now we can say that this is the expected level of coffee consumption in people with uh, pancreatic cancer in cases. And this is the level of coffee consumption in people with in controls. Now we know that there is a chance that coffee drinking might have an effect on the amount of pancreatic cancer that you might receive. But again, this is not proven yet. So we cannot call this as the final result. Now, what are the other issues? The other issues, one of the main other issues is the process of matching. So matching in general is a process of selecting controls. So the controls in general should be similar to the cases. So they should be similar in key characteristics such as age, sex, race, and we can perform it by two methods. One is individual matching, the other is group matching. Individual matching, for example, in a study of breast cancer and reproductive risk factors from New Mexico Women's Health Study, so the controls were ascertained using random digit dialing with frequency matching on ethnicity and three age groups and seven health planning districts. So this is an example of group matching. What are the problems with matching? So matching on many variables may, take, may make it difficult because we cannot find the appropriate control. And we can also explore the possible association of the disease with any other variable on which the cases and controls have might, have, might have been matched. This is one of the main problems. The next one is recall bias or the recall of information. So information on some past exposures depends on the memory of events from both cases and controls. This is often inadequate and limited because you are not sure whether the patient will remember everything or not. Next, this, big up, this brings up the concept of recall bias where the recall is better among cases than controls because of the presence of the disease. When a person has the disease, he is going to understand that he is going to be afraid and is going to tell you every single exposure that he might have had. But the same is not true for controls because controls do not have the disease. They do not have the same seriousness of understanding of what to be recalled. So that's the reason why it's hard for a person to recall things when they do not have the disease. Now, there is also what we call artificial association resulting from recall bias. For example, the controls that tell you that there is a true incidence of infection. Some people, let's say, for example, the best example of artificial association is the concept of allergies. 
the number of people who say they have allergies but do not exhibit symptoms is an example of artificial association so when a person says something that he has but does not exhibit the symptoms then there is a chance that we might consider him as a control rather than considering him as a case provided the person might not have been exposed might not have allergies at all but might be associated with some exposure to some factor that might result in that so this is another example of a study of maternal infections during pregnancy and congenital malform malformations so the true incidence of infection is about 15% but when you ask it in the interview you will only get about 13.5% in cases but the same case in controls if you ask them the true case of infection is 15% but infection rate when you, when they recall is only 1.5% so that's a 10 time decrease in the number of people who say that they did have the infection when they were controls because controls do not have any format malformations so obviously they're going to say that they don't, there's nothing wrong with them next is an example that helps in reducing that bias the called the multiple control groups because of the several limitations the selection of controls so we use multiple control groups the multiple control groups use both living controls and dead controls so and also we use the surrogates to provide the data the other example is hospital and community controls hospital controls might have some conditions that lead to frequent hospital visits and the last one is non disease controls and cancer controls so recall of past exposure with different outcomes so if the findings are in agreement between the groups so then they are likely said to be valid so an example of multiple control groups is in the case study conducted of measles and subacute sclerosing panencephalitis so there were two control groups that were used the playmates of the patients and the two were hospitalized patients in the same hospital so remember that measles is an airborne disease so the groups that you are looking for who might have been exposed here are people generally who are playmates of the patient and two are people who were hospitalized in the same hospital because there is a chance that they might have also have been exposed to the disease the other way of reducing that bias is by using a nested control study so a nested control study is conducted with a defined cohort in which exposure data and population characteristics are available to some extent and often the time of enrollment into the cohort now what are the advantages of a network nested cohort study so here we know both cases are controls and we also define the population at the risk of the disease exposure data is generally collected prior to the diagnosis of the disease and information collected has not been influenced by the knowledge of the disease status so there is no information bias so there is no information bias and it is less costly than a cohort study because we use fewer subjects and fewer tests and the specimens that are required um, so we have fewer tests and specimens that are required so an example of the nested control study was a study that determined the helicobacter pylori infection that was associated with the development of gastric cancer so they found that 189 patients with gastric cancer and they found 189 cancer free individuals that have identified from 130000 people from a hmo cohort following the studies from 1960 so they found that they were determined by using stored serum collected during the 1960s so remember that nested, nested control study is a combination of cohort plus case control. So we have the data from the cohort study and we use it to ascertain the data from the case control study. So try these examples and see if you can answer them.